getting your music out there and you're trying to get people to notice you, sometimes you just have to build it yourself. If it's not working out, just build it. And the next three people that are going to be coming up on stage are people who've built things that I even look up to and I'm incredibly, incredibly inspired by all the work that they do. So first and foremost, when I met this lady, I tried not to have a groupie moment because whenever I see her on social media and all the amazing things that she does, I'm incredibly inspired. Please put your hands together for Twiggy Molly. The next person who's coming up on stage, like, he's the guy, right? I like to call him the guy. He throws some of the coolest events in and around the country as well. Very no well known for events like Joan de Fontaine. How many of you guys been to Joan de Fontaine? How many of you guys been to Homecoming Africa? Some of the coolest events around the country. Please put your hands together. And we actually call him by his, his Twitter name, K Malachi in the building. Please put your hands together. And then last but not least on this panel is also one of my brothers from Cape Town. Um, started a space where his love for the culture, his love for sneaker culture, um, literally propelled him into creating his own space that a whole lot of brands really want to be in as well. Um, one of the guys that I think were the same height, but I look up to him. He goes by the name Zaid Osman. Please put your hands together. All three of you have started something special. You've gone, you know what? I'm not gonna wait for someone to help me create because sometimes what happens even as a musician or anything in life, you're waiting for that opportunity. You come out of varsity, you're waiting for that job. But all of you guys took the road less taken. You decided to create opportunities. You decided to create employment in a country that really needs it. So Zaid, I'm gonna start with you, right? You grew up in the United States. Yeah. And the, the bug of sneakers bit you at some point. Yeah. So it's crazy, like I grew up in the States uh, from the age of four, so started like kindergarten and all of that out there. And then we moved back to South Africa when I was 15 years old. But even during those 11 years in the States, I would always be into sneakers because every weekend there's like another release coming out. And at that time it was like Air Force Ones were big, you know, like Fat Joe was rocking the stuff, Jada Kiss, all of these guys, and it was like, you'll go into a retailer, like the baggy white tees will be in, and then like a new Air Force One colorway every week. Um, and then from there, my brother was also heavy into sneakers. So like, they yeah, would always go to like the releases, I would just go with them. And then there used to be like sneaker forums as well, where we like swap and trade and do all of that stuff online. Yeah, I came back to South Africa when I was 15 years old, still in school. Uh, a lot of people would see like the type of sneakers that myself and my brother would start wearing. Um, and then people were like, yo, where do you get them from? Started importing it. That's when I founded Lost Property um, and then really just grew into that space of constantly getting releases, flipping them overseas and then also importing sneakers. Uh, more recently, it was really looking at what we have within the African content to really promote and take overseas. Um, and then that's where like the whole Great Africa kind of thing came into play. Um, and then Sneaker Exchange is also the event that we do um, really aimed at like the youth culture and showcasing what we have and then we tie in like a lot of internationals into the space that makes sense into street culture. My dude, you're a lawyer. How did that come about from a point of starting a, 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 in, a, in, a, in a space where you studied law and then how did that propel itself into all the amazing events that you guys are throwing now? Um, so, I mean, when we started, in all honesty, the idea was never to go into events. The whole idea was we're looking for an alternative form of entertainment for friends, going away to varsity. So it was like a send-off picnic. And what we came to realize, you know, when we came home every holiday was that everybody wanted to have the picnic and, you know, everybody had met new friends and wanted to invite their new friends. And only then did it become a sort of viable economic concept. But um, for the first, I mean, I had a best friend at the time who was very adamant that, you know, within the second year that, you know, let's commercialize, let's take this thing to that level. And I decided let's not do that. Let's wait two years to actually get people to buy into the concept and to actually be willing to spend money. So to really develop a base of people that actually buy into the concept of this alternative form of entertainment because back then like the nightclubs were popping we were able to then you know cultivate that movement and 
use that sort of traction and use that time of building a genuine, authentic appetite for it to launch all our events from them. Social media has grown in leaps and bounds to a point where you can actually create a living from it. There's a lot of people who don't understand it but tend to ride the wave. But what you realize is that there's an actual path here. Tell us how that, that came about. I mean, it's the same with Katleko. Um, when I started creating content on social media, it was never to make money. Um, it was just me documenting like my lifestyle, what I get up to with my friends, places that I go to. And then it's only when I moved back to Johannesburg after Varsity that I was getting the attention from like big brands that were saying, look, we want you to create something similar to what you've already done, but we'll pay you. And obviously that was like shocking. I was just like, hmm, okay. So I, I was working in an ad agency at the time. I only lasted for eight months. I was like, why am I wasting my time at a desk in this horrible place when I can just be living my best life and getting paid for it? Back then, I don't think anybody thought that you could get paid to post on social media. It was always like a joke. Whereas now, it's like a serious profession. Like there's so much that goes into it that a lot of people don't even realize. The interesting thing about you guys choosing the path less chosen is that there's a lot of lessons that you learn along the way. So, Zaid, for instance, when you started Grade as well as Sneaker Exchange, you've learned a multitude of lessons. What are the, some of the things when you build your own thing that you have to go, like maybe three things that you can name that you have to be prepared for? Overall, it's like one is trusting your gut. You know, you came up with this idea and the concept or to run with, which was just a thought. And it's really looking at, okay, cool, how do you take this to the next level? Always being aware of the, co the consequences of actions, you know what I'm saying? If you do this, this might happen. And constantly kind of just trusting yourself in, in the process of growing. Also, it's like, it's looking at what you do and then how you can do that to better other individuals. Yeah. More uh, often than not, people get caught up in themselves, you know, yeah. and if you're really out there to change the world or even just the perception in, of how people look at Africa, yeah. I've been blessed to be able to travel a bit and people still don't know about Africa, yeah. you know? So to kind of just take that on our backs and say, oh, okay, you know, this is really what we're trying to prove is always going out there with genuine intentions, knowing what you want to do, yeah. and yeah, just trusting yourself overall. I think that's the most important. what you've noticed in creating your own business that there's some things now that you need to put in place to make sure that the business is sustainable. So if I'm an upstart and going, okay, I want to start this business, what are the next steps to make sure that one, my business doesn't die next year, that it's sustainable? What do I need to put in place? One of, one of, one of the things I say to our staff is, you know, if I'd never gone to corporate, if I'd never gotten my degree, homecoming events wouldn't be 10 years old this year. It would have died way long across the way and I always tell young guys like there's no glory in struggle there's no glory in doing things the hard way you know at uh, the peak of homecoming I was serving my articles in a law firm and balancing the two because you're saying guys build something stable get get your education get your degree get something that you can use to add value to your industry but also balance it out. So if guys say, you know, I want to go into this full time, 100%. I said, why? So can you afford to do it? No, you can't. Well, get a job. Strike the balance. Get your education. Strike the balance on our internship program. You can't intern with us if you're not studying towards a degree because we're saying you need to learn the balance to say you need to understand how the world works in order to impact the world. And that's a problem that a lot of talented people have. It's like, okay, I'm talented, I'm good at this, or I'm good at that. But their concepts fail to penetrate the market because they don't understand how the world works. And everything I've learned about leadership and how to run the company and how to set up events and how to look at events, contracts, and negotiate sponsorship, I was able to do that large and by because I had a degree, but most importantly, because I'd actually worked under people. So I knew how to lead people because I'd been led by people. And education broadens your horizons. Exposure in corporate broadens your outlook on life. And there are lessons everywhere for your business to grow. And it's also very important for anything to survive in this very fast digital era. 
that you have a base that supports what you do, that you build a base. And building a base is something that takes time. And the question is, how do I build a base while sustaining my dream? Well, get innovative. This is 2018. You can do three, four jobs and still push your passion. You can study degrees and still push your passion at the same time. With the line of work that you are doing, what, what I look up to and I really find inspiring in terms of how you've been able to create that path as well is that a lot of brands are calling us and going, hey, we were thinking that you need to do this for us, you know? You've got the following, so we want you to do this. And it has nothing to do with what Twiggy is about. How have you managed to get yourself in a space where you are having con considered chats with brands and creating content that means something, something to you and something to them? So what steps do I need to follow to get there? What I would say is building a relationship with that brand. Um, Obviously, like, for example, with Capitec, I've worked with them for, like, two, three years. So they've seen the kind of work that I produce, so they trust me enough to bring me into the conversations of whatever campaigns they have coming up. So it always helps to build a relationship with the brand. You don't want to do a once-off campaign and then you don't follow up to see how well the campaign did or if they were happy with your work or anything like that because then that brand will forget about you as quickly as you forgot about them. So I think with me that's what's helped me the most is always building a relationship with the brand and obviously working with the same brands over and over again because you want to grow with the brand and you want people when they think of you, when they think of Twiggy they think oh Capitec, do you know what I mean? Because you've done so much work with them before. So I think that's definitely what's helped me um, in the past. As an upcoming artist, rapper, person who's entrenched in the culture or not, what are your guys' thoughts on having a side hustle? How do you get that done properly if you want to go for a side hustle? Understand what that side hustle means and what it's going to take from you. And then also look at, at building a team around that side hustle and that dream. You know, people that if you and artists know that, okay, cool, you're going to need a producer, you're going to need a DJ. But look at building that. Look at the cost involved in implementing your plans, you know? And I think constantly know that if it's something that you want to do, it's going to get done, and constantly have that mindset of, this is something that is going to get done, you know? And talk it into existence. Really look at it and say, okay, cool, this is a project that I've been planning, and now is actually the time. Because, to be honest, like, the time is never right. You never know 100% that, okay, cool, by going into this new project, it's going to end up exactly as I envision it to be. I think it's like trusting the process. Start somewhere, have like a broad understanding of what you need to do, and just go out there and do that. You have to be very deliberate, and I think that's where mentorship comes in. I think it's very important for every young person to always pick somebody that they look up to and try and get themselves into a space of being mentored. My side hustle includes going to festivals and asking, yo, George, can I work at your festival? Yo, Opi Gopi, can I work at your festival? Let your side hustle fit into your vision, your dream. You want to be a rapper and artist, find out what you can do in the label. You know, can I carry a bag? Do you guys need a water boy? Try plug yourself in spaces that will allow you to stay alive and learn so that, you know, your side hustle and your vision can meet each other on the journey. I would definitely say that you have to be disciplined. Because without the discipline, one of your jobs is going to fail. Do you know what I mean? So whether it's your main or your side hustle, you're not going to give it enough attention if you're not disciplined. So if I, I mean, for example, I'm a content creator, but I also want to be a TV presenter. So I had to go to school. So that means doing less of the influencer stuff and dedicating my weekends to going to school. So you have to be very, very dedicated and focus on both, which I think a lot of people struggle with because they're not good at multitasking, but you need to know yourself that, okay, I am able to do both. Guys, thank you very much. I would invite you, if you're not doing it yet, make sure you follow these three people on social media. Guys, put your hands together.